My name is Nina Josephine and welcome to the Tiki Oasis monthly series focusing on subjects of history, appropriation versus appreciation of cultures, minority cultures, Tiki culture, and mid-century Americana. The goal of this series is to provide a forum for education, knowledge, and conversation. Throughout the series, we invite marginalized groups to amplify their voices, to share their knowledge and experiences. We invite advocates and allies to ask questions, and we invite all to contribute to the broader conversation on diversity, inclusion, uh, representation, and equality in the Tiki community. As we dive into our monthly series, there are many topics to unpack discuss and understand that are part of the current Tiki culture. For our topic this month, we have invited Sly Augustine of Trailer Happiness in London to share with us a journey through rum and the people who made it. Throughout the conversation, please put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A section below. Also, please note that this talk today is a benefit for the Drinks Trust, uh, which is an organization providing support, care, and assistance to the drinks industry workforce since 1886 in UK. Um, you should be able to find the link to the donation link in the chat box. Okay, without further ado, I'm proud to introduce Sly Augustine, born and bred in Notting Hill. It was almost fate when Sly became the owner of West London's acclaimed mid-century tiki, tiki community bar, Trailer Happiness, in 2012. Sly's lifelong love of rum started during a summer trip to St. Lucia, age 18, where after trying some powerful local rums from the barrel, he discovered a local coconut rum liqueur. From there, he grew his knowledge for the spirit becoming one of London's leading rum aficionados. In 2017, Trailer Happiness was awarded Imbibe's Rum List of the Year and received Best International High Volume Cocktail Bar at the Spirited Awards at Tales of the Cocktail in New Orleans. In 2018, Sly was awarded Rum Champion of the Year at the annual Think Rum Roundtable, as well as Trailer Happiness being voted Best Individual Bar. So without further delay, let's bring out Sly Augustine. Hey, how you doing, Nina? Great. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Hello, hello guys. How are we doing? ready to talk rum. Uh, okay, so I guess we'll just we'll just go straight in, shall we, Nina? Yes, go for yeah? it. It's all yours. All right, perfect. Sorry, I, I'm I'm used to the to the drum rolls. Um, so I'm basically <laughs> first first and foremost, um just want to say thank you um, to Tiki Oasis for inviting me to talk a little bit about rum. Um, I previously did a talk um, for Gimme Brown where I spoke about rum in the context of history and I wanted to kind of put a bit more focus on um, the people and that's just kind of ground rum you know in in reality. I know that a lot of people, um, I say a lot of people, I know some people um, like to or don't like to mix their love of rum with politics. But the unfortunate reality of rum is that it is politics. Like at every junction um, of its existence, it has been either at the forefront or right beside the, the, the issues of the day. So um, I'm just gonna get, up, get on with this presentation and hopefully, you know, just kind of, just wanna share a little bit of of um, of history, I'm not a historian, and there are definitely people more qualified to, do, to talk about history of rum. But I I just wanted to kind of frame rum um, in a way that that kind of connects it to the people that made it. So 
without further ado, let me get my share screen. I'm going to assume everybody can see this and there's no problems. Uh, so, run power people. Now, we can't talk about rum without discussing sugar. Um, a lot of the, you know, of the, 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 the catalyst for everything that, that, that happened leading up to rum um, is obviously a result of the sugar industry. And this is, this is you know, the two, the, two of the, the two of them are obviously inextricably linked. So I just wanna cover that initial period first. So it's estimated that sugarcane was first cultivated in Papua New Guinea around 6,000 BC. And um, it took a while for Europe to catch on, but when they did, they did not. They, well, they certainly made up for lost time. So Papua New Guinea um, was actually the Malay word, which refers to the frizzled quality of the uh, Melanesian people's hair, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, the uh, Austrotonians, probably butchered that word. Um, traders introduced sugar to Asia um, around 4,000 years later, around 1,000 BC, it's understood. And, you know, during India's Iron Age, so this is this is kind of when sugar made its way out of Papua New Guinea and started to spread around Asia. Now, it wasn't until the Moors began their expansions that sugarcane really started to take root in um, parts of Africa, parts of Northern Africa, and um, in Spain, in Europe. So it st slowly started to creep in. Um, but it wasn't really until the Christian Crusades um, of, the 11th, of the 11th century that, the, that sugar made its way into, you know, um, specifically England, but into main, main, what we call mainland Europe. So um, Crusaders, came back with various you know things wonders that they had discovered during their during their travels and this was one of the new spices that they discovered and it was absolutely um, embraced by the um, by the elites um, particularly by the the royal family um, 1243 it said that Edward I was consuming 3,000 kilograms of sugar a year um, at, at an equivalent cost of $125 per kilo. Um, I'm not sure how much that is in pounds. And, you know, to give you some idea of, of the luxury or how luxurious sugar was at that time, but well, the price the price remained relatively high for the next century. And, you know, 1319, price of sugar was still, even though it had fallen slightly, it was still approximately $100 per kilogram. So this was something very much um, for the incredibly wealthy um, only. Um, it wasn't being cultivated on, on, on large enough scales to, to become you know, commercially um, viable, to become available to the masses. And it became a real status symbol for the rich and in this illustration here you'll see that wealthy individuals would often or began, be, began using it to make these elaborate sculptures so what you're seeing is a dinner table and all of these items on the table were carved from sugar um which is incredible uh, just you know so i would I, I would absolutely have loved to have seen it um from a distance um, but yeah, so this just gives you an idea of of where of where sugar started in it, you know, in its in its early in its early uh, early days. So as sugar um, continued to spread ar across Europe, Portugal became one of the uh, kind of main areas to, to cultivate sugarcane. Obviously sugarcane requires a certain type of climate. And, you know, for the most part, Europe isn't the ideal 
place to grow sugarcane. Um, Portugal had taken ownership of some islands, um, notably Madeira, and had decided to make Madeira their sugarcane outpost. The other thing that happened once they decided to make Madeira their outpost was they also um, began the, this was literally the first stage of the transatlantic slave trade. So this was, this was the first step. The Portuguese were the first people who decided that they were going to capture Africans and use their labor in the production of sugar. And it was incredibly, incredibly beneficial for them. Um, you know, their output went from 1472, exporting 280 tons to 2000, 2,500 tons um, in, a, in a relatively short space of time. It was also what um, I think we can consider as the first instance of um, man really trying to dominate nature or trying to, um, you know, it was it was the first example of rampant capitalism at the expense of the environment. So in this instance, this cash cow was basically milked to destruction. Um, and by 1530, production had fallen by 90%. So obviously um, due, due in the most part to deforestation because they didn't, they no longer had the, the supplies, the wood they needed to fuel the boilers. They had exhausted it um, in the pursuit of, 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 of wealth and quick wealth. Obviously, you know, it's another reason why you would, you would employ slaves or slave labor. And, you know, if that was kind of the, the preview than the actual episode one of what would become um, the Triangle Trade was gentleman who I like to call the stumbling Columbus. Um, Christopher Columbus is very well known for discovering countries um, by basically sailing around, getting lost and guessing where he was. Um, one of the places that he discovered was Hispaniola in 1492. And uh, the reason that this became really uh, an interesting, um, well, like the nucleus for, for sugarcane industry is because he brought sugarcane with him. Um, they tried to, to plant various products um, on the lands, tobacco, you know, other bits and pieces, and it just, it just wasn't really working out. And um, sugarcane was one of the more successful crops, although at that point, the Spanish didn't really possess the, um, the technique or the ability to properly harvest sugarcane and their yields weren't incredibly um, valuable to the crown. So they continued their pursuits for, for gold, ultimately ended up um, settling in South America, where they improved their sugar production techniques massively, but they had started at this point, they had started something of a trend. Now, when I say started something of a trend, I'm talking about Europeans arriving in, in uh, foreign lands, arriving in, uh, in foreign lands and uh, decimating the uh, indigenous peoples. Um, this was this was a, a theme that unfortunately ran through throughout the next um, several centuries. Um, Hispaniola, the original, the original peoples. Let me just get this up here. The original um, inhabitants of Hispaniola, uh, the the Arawak and and Taino population, were devastated. Um, mostly by disease, things like smallpox and, and the other, the other uh, um, bugs that they weren't used to that the um, Europeans brought with them, but also, you know, enforced slave labor and food shortages because all of the resources of the island was being diverted to feed 
the settlers and the, and the colonists. So um, they were they were declining and their their you know birth rates were declining. Um, mortality was was, was um, increasing. Um, and this is now where we get to the point where African slaves start being shipped across the Atlantic. So they've they've quickly realized that they are it, they are not capable of sustaining the indigenous population. So again, in that pursuit of profits, the logical solution for them was to simply bus in um, African slaves. It had worked. It would have worked well in um, for the for the Portuguese in Madeira, and this was the next stage um, in that in that process. Now we move, we transition now slowly into the world of rum. So we kind of covered the the the, the birth of sugar. I'm, pr I'm sure everybody knows this, but just to recap, you know, rum is a spirit made from distilling sh either sugarcane molasses or sugarcane juice. Um, although sugarcane spirits have existed and, you know, uh, South America definitely have their own versions, cachaças and whatever else was going on at the time, it is widely accepted that rum, as we understand it, specifically molasses rum, was born in Barbados during the mid 17th century. Um, the original version, which was like a crude kind of moonshine, um, is believed to have been produced by enslaved Africans um, and referred to as Kill Devil, um, was the precursor to a more palatable, uh, more acceptable version of rum, which, which evolved once the Dutch um, settlers brought their equipment over, started to bring over um, proper distilling equipment and realized very quickly that they could utilize what was what was up until that point a complete byproduct molasses was something that was fed to animals or just you know thrown into the sea like it was it was a complete waste product so at this point you know almost by accident um they're starting to realize that they've got the potential to pull back to claw back additional revenue Excuse me. Um, and this is just an example of some of the, the early sugar mills, um, and you know the kind of tech, the kind of technology they would use at, during that during that period um, was pretty pretty basic. But then once the introduction of distilling on plantations was introduced. It accelerated the expansion and it accelerated the technology involved in the production of rum. And now we started to see, you know, you had your, you start to get your windmills to process um, sugarcane. And you start to see your kind of distilleries appearing and, and taking up a more dominant position um, in the whole kind of framework of a sugar plantation. And at this point, you know, rum really started to kind of gain traction and it, it was now at a situation where the waste product from sugar production was producing a product which they could then use to trade for more slaves to make more rum to work in cotton fields and to produce more products that they could then use to get more slaves. And this is the introduction of what is known as the triangle trade. So you have slaves coming across from Africa, you know, they're landing in in the Caribbean islands and, and uh, New England um, in the American colonies. And they are being used to create products which are then being shipped rum, you know, molasses, timber, um, fabrics, which are then being shipped either to the UK to be sold, but also to the African, to the African coast, um, in order to pay the, um, what I call, what I call their collaborators or their, um, you know, their fix it men, 
um, it, it, who would who would procure slaves for them. So um, weapons, alcohol, and um, textiles were incredibly um, desirable at that time, and they actually made alcohol specifically stronger um, for for the African export. Um, I think the reasons for that are pretty obvious. Um, here we can see kind of an example of a cargo ship that would be loaded with goods and also slaves and would make that route. So it became, you know, at that point, we really start to see the commodific commodification of, of African bodies and African people as a, as, a, as a stock item to be stored alongside rums and grain and whatever other produce um, they happen to acquire along their voyage. And, you know, this is, it's, this is a period where everything is going really well for everybody. You know, the colonies are, are starting to, to really um, just, just rake in profits um, from the colonies. But it's always this kind of, you know, slight tension between different different communities and different factions and um in there's always politics so in 1715 france banned the production of rum on any of their colonies because they were getting complaints from um the brandy um producers back in france so they were getting complaints from the brandy producers back in france that were saying you know this rum is too cheap obviously brandy um, it's being produced in France. It's, they're not using they're not using slave labor for the most part. They're not using slave labor in well, definitely not in the in the extent that it's being used on the um, on the islands on the colonies. And they see this as an unfair advantage. And you know the the, the, the government, the crown, they don't want to upset um, the brandy producers, so they completely ban the um, the production of rum. Now, what this did was it it left the French island, French colonies with a surplus of molasses, um, which, they, which they then started to trade with the American colonies, with the New England colonies. And, you know, New England, this was great for New England because the molasses was cheap. The French had absolutely no, no other, nothing to do with it. It was super cheap. And at that point, New England was absolutely booming and making, you know, a massive amounts of rum um for you know for a very very competitive price and then and then they were now using that rum in order to purchase slaves and in order to purchase other items so the problem with this obviously was that this was not allowed by either the french or the british crown and we, we then got another voice which came out complaining and this this time it was the planters um the british um plantation owners in the British owned Caribbean Isles. So in the British colonies in the Caribbean, so whereas we had the brandy guys complaining, which kicked off the French molasses being sold to the Americans, we've now got the British Caribbean um, plantation owners are complaining because they can't make rum that cheap, you know, and the these New England people, this isn't fair and, and you know, something needs to be done about this. So the British Crown introduced the Molasses Act of 1733 and this was um incredibly high tax i mean it was it was kind of ridiculous um and it was it was such that you know in all in all in all in all reality it was it was such a high tax that they couldn't follow it even if even with all the will in the world it would have put pretty much all of the distilleries in america out of business so you know at that point, rum accounted for about 80% of New England's exports. And as I said, it would have put them out of, out of business. So they just kind of ignored it. I mean, you know, they, England at that point didn't really have the, you know, they were trying to appease the Caribbean um, plantation owners, but they didn't really have the facilities to enforce it. Um, so it was mostly ignored and uncollected. It would, however, be the precursor to the sugar tax, which came later and which was um, much more um, controversial. Now, as I said earlier, um, 
because rum had replaced or had become had replaced brandy as the preferred spirit stock for slave trading um it was also another reason why um americans were were absolutely reveling in their production of it um and probably a reason why the caribbean british caribbean islands were you know were, were reluctant to give up their monopoly um at the at the age of six I, I, this was just a uh, an example, at the age of six, Venture Smith, um, who was named Venture by his um, slave master, who considered his purchase a venture. Um, he was captured at the age of six, and he was sold for four gallons of rum and a piece of calico cloth. Now four gallons, I want to say just over four cases, let's call that. So you, at that point, four cases of rum will buy, you a, will buy you a slave. Four cases of rum and a piece of cloth will buy you a slave. And, and if you owned a, you know, if you owned a distillery that was producing rum, you were in this incredible loop where the slaves that you pay for are paying for more slaves. So it was just an infinite loop. And the wealth generated from it was, uh, you know, unprecedented and, and easily responsible for um, the majority of, of cities in England, for, for sure. Um, the big cities outside of London, like Manchester and Liverpool, um, only exist, their textile infrastructure and their, their, the industrial revolution that took place there came directly as a result of of this this period this is why you i don't know if you've seen um recently there's been a lot of statues that have been torn down because these guys at during that time had so much wealth that they could very they could be very generous they could afford to be very generous they could afford to invest back home to improve their standing in society and obviously to in, increase their influence on the on the government of the time now, when I talk about the politics on rum, there was constantly lobbying, much in the same way that we see businesses are lobbying at, you know, during these times. There was stuff, constantly stuff going on. There was, they were constantly at war, the French with the British, the Spanish. This was an ongoing situation. And, and at one point in 1762, um, French planters handed over Martinique to the British. They had already occupied Guadeloupe and they didn't have any facilities to defend themselves at that point. So they just handed it over to the British. Curiously though, the British only stayed on there for one year. And the only thing they did during that year was improve the quality and efficiency of rum production on the island, which at that point was treated with very little care. Um, strangely, this improvement in the quality of rum on Martinique was directly, um, responsible or influential in removing the ban that had been previously placed. So all of a sudden, word got back that this fine quality spirit was being produced now in the colonies. The kind of the brandy guys had relaxed a little bit and they decided that they were going to allow the export of, of of rum back into France. They also allowed certain free ports, which meant that now the French could start trading with North America. And this happened literally a year after the British left um, uh, Martinique. So in this, in this regard, you know, as is mostly the case, the, uh, people are often the, the um, manufacturers of, the, of their own downfall. So we're starting to get a little bit of tension now between the different factions in the colonies. Um, this is just a um, a little frame. So this is this is the venture, the gentleman venture Smith, and he actually has his memoirs published. Um, it's one of the few um, enslaved Africans to have documented his entire story from capture, um, and I believe he was, yeah, he was in. Um, in America for uh, over 60 years. So um, 
definitely something worth worth checking out if you are so inclined. Now, I spoke before about um, the molasses tax and how that kind of didn't really work out and it kind of fell fell to the wayside. Um, the British were determined, though, to to improve improve their taxes. So, as I said, seventeen, you know, just just previously now, um, the Americans are doing absolutely amazing um, trade. They're now trading with the French colonies, um, and this is just this is really upsetting the British interests in the Caribbean. And so now they're determined to increase, you know, to really increase like. Um, increase their revenue. So what they've come up with is they've forget the molasses tax. Now they've introduced the sugar tax, and you know it's not it's not quite as harsh as the molasses tax was. And their thinking would be that you know if we reduce it to something that's almost reasonable, maybe maybe these guys will actually pay it this time. But I think the ship had sailed. I think it was really at this point the New England had really. Um, kind of gained its own, started to gain its own independence, started to gain its own identity, and had really wasn't really interested in in what in what Britain had to say. Um, and this is when we saw, you know, this, we start to see the protests um, ultimately leading to the sorry, leading to the American Revolution. Now. You know this whole period of time so this is like we've gone from the sugar production beginning of the sugar production um into rum production and we've now seen how rum has become this really influential and important commodity among the colonies um but what's also happening is there's a lot of fighting it's starting to get really expensive to protect you know to protect your territory to um, maintain law and order, you know, to, to kind of to, to keep um, slave uprisings controlled. So there's a lot of different things happening and you slowly start to see a withdrawal um, at the beginning of the 19th century. Now, bear in mind that the, the British slave traders alone at this point had had brought in around a trillion a trillion pounds in today's money um purely purely based on the sale of um african people this is not this isn't this is not this doesn't speak about the industries that were created by these people this is just a direct um benefit of selling bodies um slaves at that you know during that period were also producing around 75% of exported goods um, from these new colonies. So, you know, the impact on the, you know, the impact on the new, on the old world, if you, if you want to call it that, was incredible. Um, and there was a lot of, there's a lot of people at this point, I think that a lot of people had so much, had so much cash, so much wealth at this point that I think they they slowly started to lose that that hunger for conquest. Um, they were much more interested in looking after their you know all of the stuff that they acquired back home. Um, and yeah, like I say, it was slowly starting to become a little less um, economically viable as more and more sugar production started to increase around South America and you know, all over, just start to move around different, different territories. And one of the, one of the major kind of influences in the decline of the slave trade, or at least that version of the slave trade, was the Haitian Revolution. So we know that slavery was officially um, ended at the start of the 19th century. And it's no coincidence that this coincided with the Haitian Revolution, which saw um, slaves. And it's also interesting that the the kind of the the ending of slavery began in the place, or, you know, began in the place 
where it began. Right. So it started in the place where slavery began. So Hispaniola, as it was then known, which is which became Haiti and the Dominican Republic, became the the focus point for the, the, the worst fears of Europe. So they had long feared that ultimately at some point the slaves are gonna rev- are gonna rise up, revolt, and kill everybody in their sleep. And this is exactly what happened. Um, this was again all to do with 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 political um, moves that that were made for other reasons, but which ultimately created problems that they didn't envisage. So one of the things that happened was they the um, the French crown at the time had given had given free men in in the colonies a certain level of citizenship and this created a whole crazy tension because you had these different sections of of communities within the island so you would have rich white planters and you'd have the kind of more working class um, citizens, and then you'd have the uh, mixed race um, um, community, which would be obviously the children of plantation owners for the most part. And they were afforded a level of, excuse me, they were, they were afforded a level of status above um, black slaves. So you had this whole um, tension which was which was building and building and building and this was the ultimately the, the nucleus for the for the revolution which was which was again the start of the end of this version of slavery now as the sorry let me just Oops. My slides in order. Right, so um, sugar for the masses, um, pity for the poor Africans. So as the price of sugar fell, um, as as slavery, as Britain started to recoil and started to kind of step away from the kind of policing of slavery and you know started to stop you know trying to enforce all of these stuff it was fine here and it was it was it was dealing with a lot of issues at that point um it started to step back and it it started to ease restrictions on trade so the monopoly that the british owned caribbean islands had had enjoyed with regards to sugar exports evaporated and at that point, it became something of a free-for-all. And all of a sudden, sugar was available to the masses. Right? So everybody, the working class, you, you know, remember that sugar had been a luxury for over 100 years. And all of a sudden, the working class man or the working class, you know, white European was now able to enjoy these incredible delights of sugar. I don't, if you can imagine tasting sugar for the first, you know, or on a regular basis being being um, introduced to sugar into your diet. And um, what happened here was in a strange way, whereas the elite had started to become, had started to become bored of sugar, you know, they, they were kind of over it at this point. It was, they could have it when they wanted. It wasn't really that impressive to them anymore. Um, and they'd started to, you know, because of their, because of their wealth and, and, and the, the whole kind of um, the revolution that they had created, the industrial revolution. And, you know, there was, and everything that they that achieved, there was this almost like this enlightenment period. So all of a sudden people started to go, you know, rich elites were like, well, do you think what we're doing is kind of bad? You know, they started to ask this question. It was like, I think we might be going to hell. And this was a this was a question that was only asked, you know, at a point when they'd all very happily made their made their profits. But it was a question that was asked nonetheless. Um, so you had this weird situation where the people responsible for enslaving Africans 
were now of the opinion that it shouldn't happen anymore. But because they had now stepped back from slavery and they'd stepped back from all of these um, restrictions and tariffs, they had inadvertently unleashed sugar upon the working class. And now the working class were not prepared to give up this treat that they had just been um, gifted, right? And this is where we get this weird situation of the working class, um, what's what I'm looking for? Um, kind of uh, reluctance or, there's a mm, brain freeze. It's fine, let's go with reluctance. So they had this kind, you know, they had this resentment. That's, come on, guy. They had this resentment, right, for African slaves that they'd never met. But all they knew was that in order to have all of these amazing things that they were enjoying, Africans needed to remain slaves. And because of this, the emancipation of slaves was significantly delayed. So here's an example of um, commentary from an elite member of society. This was, this was, you know, for for, for many educated, um, wealth wealthy individuals, this was the kind of thought process of the time. So he said, you know, sweetened drinks of tea, coffee, and chocolate were rendered suddenly nauseating by the notion that they contained the blood of slaves. Conversely, for those in the lower classes, um, it was a slightly different story. And I'm going to read you. There was a, a poet um, who used to write about stuff at the time. And this one I thought was really interesting. And this is called Pity for the African. And it says, I own I am shocked at the purchase of slaves and fear those who buy them and sell them are knaves. What I hear of their hardships, their torture and groans is almost enough to draw pity from stones. I pity them greatly, but I must be mum. For how could we do without sugar and rum? Especially sugar, so needful we see. What, give up our desserts, our coffee and tea? Besides, if we do, the French, Dutch and Danes will heartily thank us, no doubt, for our pains. If we do not buy the poor creatures, they will, and their groans will be multiplied still. Now, what I find really interesting about this perspective is that the human capacity to justify horror is not new. So when you think about when you think about slavery and when you think about the racism that exists in society today, you know, slavery is obviously that catalyst and that, that massive focal point behind it. But what you have to remember as well is that the people who were involved in slavery could give a shit one way or another what color the people were. It was just a convenient device for them to use in order to make money. They didn't care. They didn't have a personal aversion to people of a darker hue. In many cases, they worked happily with them. Um, they even respected them. If they were educated, they would socialize with them. Their, their um, conspirators on the African coast, I'm sure they got along absolutely swimmingly. So we have to remember that the idea of inferiority within the black race was purely a financial tool. It was a device that was utilized by a particular section of society who were only interested in the pursuit of, of wealth. And it was used by, by, this, by this section of society to, to justify what they were doing, but they didn't believe it. And it wasn't until this period of, of um, kind of mass, it wasn't until sugar and, and all of these products were re re released into the into the wild, if you like, that we started to see this real kind of resentment building amongst the working class, white people, and slave laborers who they felt were a potentially going to stop them from getting what they want, and b at this point during the abolish times they felt that the government and politicians were spending too much time trying to help slaves whereas they felt that 
they needed assistance and that they weren't looking after their interests as you know laborers um, in the, in the um, in the home countries. So this was really kind of the beginning of of, of a problem which we have unfortunately yet to to um, navigate. So, oops, I've already done that one. So, yeah, one thing um, that we start to see, though, um, which I thought was very interesting, is with places like Haiti, um, introduction of products like Barbon Court. Now, Barbon Court started producing in 1862, um, not too long after independence. And What's interesting to me is we're starting to see rums exist uh, post slavery, even though conditions on Haiti were not ideal. Um, the founder of Rum Barbanco, I believe, came from the cognac region. So you started to see um, a kind of a less, slightly less exploitative um, methods of rum production, but more importantly, you started to see the people on the on the islands become more involved in the product. It became more, it was less of simply an export item and it started to kind of blend into the culture and started to become more connected to the people. Um, and I think this is kind of the first this is the start, I think, of what, what I would call the island pride for the rums produced on the islands. Um, that is to say, things were not were still not ideal. Um, let's see where. Um, spoke about Haitian rum, um, Barbados rum at that, at that, you know, during the, the early part of the rum production era, as I said, it's kind of accepted that Barbados was the starting point for rum as we know it. And it's really interesting because Barbados at, at one point was hands down the most valuable commodity for the, for the British colonies. At one point it made more money than all of the other British territories combined. So you kind of went from that stage to the Barbon Court era and um, just a quick fact about Mount Gay Distillery, just because I thought it was interesting, but Mount, originally Mount Gilboa um, plantation, which was purchased by uh, John Solber, um, John Solber and his son. But they would spend most of their time in England and it, it was an investment. They didn't really want to be on site managing a plantation. So they employed so John Gay, Aline to kind of oversee their their um, their business, and um, so I've got a bit of a cold, so it's kind of making my head a bit slow. Um, not that it's, not that it's particularly fast normally, uh, but yeah. So they they handed over the the reins to Sir John Sir John Gay Aline, and when he died, the distillery was, was renamed Mount Gay um, in his honour. Um, and there, there is still his influence on the island is was 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 very broad, and I think there's still schools and um, various things named after him. Um, but just kind of kind of looking at the, the the landscape of rum, haven't got time to touch on every single um, aspect of it. But going back to the kind of the end and and, and the end of the slave trade and the end of that kind of period of rum production, we start to see once the once the sugar, once the price falls out of sugar, there's not really any need for the sugar estates in the same way that it was before. And we and because sugar and because the rum distilleries are often attached, almost exclusively attached to the sugar plantations, we see a decline in rum distilleries. And in the 19th century, we we've gone from 126 rum distilleries to now where we have six distilleries um, and you know I think I don't even think all of them 
are date back from that from that period. One of the things that I thought was fascinating, um, and forgive me with skipping skipping around in time a little bit, but one of the things that I felt was was quite interesting was that during that period um, after revolution at the, at the kind of at the end of of first edition slavery we start to see all of these new things happening so 1870 sugarcane took up 57 percent of martinique's farmlands at a time when sugarcane prices were plummeting um, and this is due to the worldwide overproduction so as i said the rains had been had been lifted in the start of the 19th century and by this point, the price of sugar is just not viable, right? So, you know, we've also got sugar beets. And 1870 was also the year when America started its first commercial production of, of beet sugar. Um, so, you know, you've got this massive price drop. And all of a sudden, all of these uh, plantation owners in Martinique are going through um, shortages. And suffering massive amounts of debt. So they need to find a new value in sugarcane. Now, just a few years prior, we spoke about rum barbancourt and rum barbancourt was a rum, what is a rum, made from uh, sugarcane juice. And what they realize now is that the, pr the price of sugar was so low that it didn't really make sense to you know to to in to in to include that aspect of production it was more beneficial so while the price of sugar had declined the price of rum had actually been increasing in france so as i mentioned because of the improved quality of rum because they had now been allowed to trade rum back to france you know, trade rums in the Americas, but because they've now been able to send rums back to France, they had enough of a market there to justify switching their interests purely to the production of rum. And um, in 1854, this is another massive step, in 1854, France um, had also decided to remove all prohibition and customs duties on alcohol of foreign and colonial origin. Now this coincided with the French wine blight. So 1863, over, over a period of 15 years, 40% of vineyards in France are destroyed um, and they're destroyed by an American aphid. So it's just a, like the, you talk about karma. So you wanted to trade with America and now America have delivered you an aphid that wipes out 40% of your vineyards over a period of 15 years. It's quite, quite poetic. Um, but what this meant, while, while this was devastating for the wine industry, what it meant was there was space now for the rum, for the French um, Caribbean rum producers to market their product back home. And this is really the birth of what we of what we know today as rum agriculture without these without these um events happening to create this perfect storm we probably wouldn't we probably wouldn't have this liquid that we that we know and love um it also helped because agriculture was distinctly distinctly different from molasses rum it also helped with you know avoiding conflict with other rum producing islands because this was something different Now, we can't really talk about rum without, especially in the Caribbean, without talking about Cuban rum. And, you know, rum, at that point, rum is, is still kind of got this negative association for many people. It's not really, um, outside, of, outside of France, it's not really considered a, a high-end spirit. And, um, you know, we're heading to the Cuban Cuban era. So during World War One, um, the Allied governments 
control the prices and distribution of sugar. Now, after the war, so it's around 1990, they deliberated on whether or not to purchase the Cuban sugar crop or liberalize the market. So basically they ummed and ahed about this. And what, they, and what this did was it created a speculative frenzy and um, the government declined to purchase the sugar. Um, controls fell by the wayside, there was a global shortage and the price of sugar tripled for a short, not for a short moment before crashing at the end of the year. But as the prices went high, so did the price of Cuban properties. And American firms encouraged Cubans to take out loans on the dream that they would make absolute fortunes um, once the, you know, once the Americans purchased the, the sugar crops. So America, so Cuban businesses took out massive loans for millions of pounds. Um, and then ultimately the price of sugar which had tripled, it didn't last, it, 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 dr it dropped dramatically. And all of a sudden, all of, these, all of these Cuban businesses were in crisis and now owed incredible amounts of money to the United States of America. One of the businesses um, that suffered greatly during this time, I believe was, the, was, was, was owned by um, the father of Fidel Castro. Now, because of the debt, and because obviously these businesses had no, no way of, of um, paying back the debt, the American banks took over a number of Cuban sugar plantations during that time. And many of the larger US sugar companies in Cuba just vertically integrated um, Cuban sugar, sugar processes with their own, meaning that they didn't, they, you know, they could bypass any kind of export tax and this really, you know, it was like a kick in the teeth. So the Cuban industry was already kind of on its knees at this point. And this, now the Americans really um, had a massive advantage within Cuban, within the Cuban uh, business infrastructure. So um, the Cubans also added, um, so the American government also added restrictions that made it, made it, you know, um, non-viable to export products to the United States. Now, the American ownership of business at this time, so like I said, this was, this was 19, 19, 20, was eerily convenient because the, at this exact same time, America had announced the start of prohibition. So as we know, the, the, um, Let me just pause this for a minute. Sorry, guys, I just realized. All right, I'm going to try this again. Just bear with me one second. Okay, yeah. So, so you had so obviously during this period where Americans were flocking to Cuba um, to spend incredible amounts of money. You also had majority of businesses and hotels and bars conveniently owned by Americans. Now, around this period, so it's, you know we're going from the twenties to the thirties. Um, rum, as I as I alluded to, still had a very kind of dark, it's dark past had not escaped, you know, it hadn't moved really beyond its roots in the regard of black exploitation. 
And um, as you can see in these labels, it was still very much a colonial um, product that exploited or and, and, to, and to a degree celebrated exploitation of, of African, of enslaved Africans. Um, and this is just a handful of mad labels and stuff that was that was rocking around at that point. Now, also during the period, um, um, I think something that I think was really kind of useful to reframing rum uh, and to beginning to give sense, beginning to give rum a different type of identity was the birth of tiki. Now, obviously, there are conversations that can be had regarding the um, appropriation of Polynesian um, religion and art. But there is no doubt that rum as a category owes a lot to the emergence of the tiki movement. Um, obviously, I'm pretty sure everybody watching this understands um, that Don the Beachcomber, 1933, opened on the Beachcomber, followed by Trader Vic. Um, and these two gentlemen really kind of, their competitiveness and their creativity gave rum a completely different position um, in the world and they made it they made it cool particularly Don the Beachcomber with his bar in LA which was um, which was a haunt for many many LA uh, movie stars it gave it a different a different kind of um, image and you know another aspect of it was it created this kind of a hunger or a desire for more interesting rums and more high quality rums. So one of the things that, that Tiki introduced to rum was the idea of blending different rums in drinks. So now you were taking all of these different threads of rum that had been created throughout the previous years due to wars and due to you know, other anomalies, um, convenience, and kind of brought them all back in house and brought them into one kind of generally understood focal point, which is why when a lot of people think of rum now, they think of tiki, you know, which is why a lot of rum bars are also tiki bars. Um, I think that was that was the first step in kind of taking um, rum away from that from that aspect. There was also the the kind of the holiday element of it and the island element of it that hadn't previously existed with regards to rum. Like I say, if you look at those old bottle labels, there was no carnival sunshine party vibes at all. There was nothing. Um, there was none of the kind of um, cues that we now we currently associate with rum existed during, prior to this time. Um, it was all very much colonial bootleg. Um, so yeah, so Tiki kind of brought that brought that element um, to the masses. And, you know, why I think that was important is because, you know, I, I spoke about it a little bit before when I, when I mentioned um, the uh, pride of rum and the island pride that people were, were then able to have once, you know, it was no longer slave labor, but just labor. You know, we, we start to see this fusion of rum and community. And we start to see ownership taken by the people who now, who are no longer slaves, who are now make up the, um, the citizens of these, of these, of these ex-colonies. And we start to see them embrace and define um, rum as a category. Um, so the Caribbean islands, you know, when, when you go to Jamaica, I think, I'm not sure the exact number, I think Zan, I should have asked Zan actually before, but I know that there are hundreds of these little rum shacks dotted around, um, dotted around Jamaica, as an example, and they are part, they are a very big part of the community, 
you know, Jamaica also uses Ray Nephew as a a kind of uh, a blessing, and uh, it's very much a kind of almost like a spiritual liquid to many Jamaicans, where they will use it to bless a new house or to, you know, pay respects at a funeral. So this really now has become a product that represents a people. So it, it, the people who originally made the product have now, you know, maybe not so much in a, in a financial sense. We know that big business always always rules ultimately, but definitely in a spiritual sense, um, they have taken and claimed it for themselves. And I see it a lot when people come into my bar from various islands and they gravitate immediately to the rum that they know. It doesn't matter whether you think this rum is not of good quality or you think there's a better rum. They are connected to that rum and that's what they want. And that's the story. And that's the connection. And that's something that I think doesn't exist in any other spirit, in any, in any, any other spirit category. It's something that I think is, um, that defines rum and makes rum incredibly um, unique. Um, just, just talking about that again, like the culture of rum now, you know, we now have many numerous um, rum festivals that take place around the world. And this is a, it's an example of how rum has now taken its place within the community. And it's now moving and evolving beyond what it previously represented. Now, what does the future of rum look like? This is a question that I often get asked and I've been on many panels talking about the future of rum. For me, the future of rum is incredible. Um, premium and, uh, and above rum segment um, has seen volumes soar by more than 140% in just the last five years. And the market is expected to grow annually by 8.1%. And for me, it's really important that rum grows in the right way because for all of its dark history and for all of the pain and the um, suffering that it's caused, I believe that it can be utilized and it can be um, leveraged to, to kind of give something back to those communities. Um, I'm, I'm starting to see more faces and more Caribbean faces involved in the production of rum and involved in the, in the, in the sale of rum and in, in the industry in general. And um, for me, it's really important that the people that make the rum are, are properly rewarded for it and that, you know, the, the, the category is properly respected. And um, yeah, I want to see, I want to see, um, I want rum to be, I want everybody to be connected to rum. I want rum to be that, that perfect, all encompassing um, spirit. So when I talk about the future of rum, I think that rum producers in general understand that we are now moving beyond the colonial, the colonial past and we are now entering a, uh, a phase or we're entering an era where we now need to communicate to a much broader, a much broader audience and also kind of, you know, give back to the communities that ultimately sacrifice so much for this product to exist in the first place. So, you know, I just as, as, as some examples of that kind of transition, which I appreciate, is if we take a look at the Appleton Estate Bowls, we can see that they are moving away from this kind of plantation, plantation owning habitation, like, you know, they're, they're kind of moving away from that, that kind of um, colonial fairy tale and, you know, moving to something which is much more, I think, inclusive and much, and, and represents the, the time that we, that we're in today. You know, this is an, this is an, uh, an incredible for me. This is an incredible example of understanding what rum represents to the community and what it represents today. So, you know, when you look at the bottle of Appleton on the left, that's that is that is colonial. Like that is 
the a product of British colonial rule. That is an export product. That that label is made to appeal to British people in the countryside. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 a Jamaican liquid, but the product is not Jamaican. And then you look to the right and you see where they're taking the brand. So it's obviously the same liquid, but it's just a it's just a rebranding. And you know you can be cynical and obviously you do things in business to to make profit. But I applaud this move because to me. When I think of Jamaican rum, especially rum on this level, which is just a just a basic mixer, it's not something that you'd necessarily sip, you know. Um, it's just something, you know, just an easy easy mixing rum, um, high volume. But for me, this is what this speaks much more to the culture and the people of Jamaica um, than the than the previous um, iteration, the pre previous versions. Um, and I think I think that's commendable. And um, this is just um, just a quick, my, the last post I wanted to post, because I thought, again, um, when I was growing up, like, I know I, I, know I, I, know I look young. No, but um, when I was growing up, there was no, no, there was, rum did not speak to anybody from the diaspora. It didn't speak to anybody of colour um, outside of, the actual islands. So you, it, was, it was strange because if you went to Jamaica or went to the islands, there'd be all these posters, normally of very, very curvy women wearing very, very little. And this was the way that they'd appeal to um, to the communities on the island. But in but internationally, rum didn't speak to to the community of rum. You know, in terms of you know the the the, the place where it's produced and the people that make it. And I just thought that was really. Um, really strange considering um that most of the places that make rum are full of black and brown people um so when i saw this advert and i'm just this is just going to end on this i've been rambling for a bit but when i saw this it, it just kind of gave me a real optimism um that we are now moving into a world where we can all have some sense of pride and ownership in something that I'm very passionate about. You know, I'm not interested in, I'm not really into whiskeys because, um, although I will drink your good whiskey, but I'm not as interested in it because for me, it doesn't connect to the community in the same way that rum does. And I'm not interested in bottles of rum that cost 15,000 pounds because I want to be able to drink it with people I like. Um, so the direction that rum is taking and its position in history going forward, I think is really up to us ultimately, um, but I'm optimistic and I think that it is going in a great direction. Um, and on that note, I have no idea how long I've been talking for, but on that note, I will uh, hand you back to the lovely Nina. Thank you very much. Awesome. I... Okay, wow. Um, okay, Sly, we do have a few questions, but before we dive into that, I just want to say thank you so much for so wholeheartedly giving us this history and insight into rum production. I know I have learned so much, um, and we have some amazing questions. Um, and I know from here on out, I'm going to be saying a little thank you to the ancestors every time <laughs> I enjoy my favorite rum yeah. drink. So like a million times. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So questions. Uh, we have some fantastic questions. I'm going to try to kind of consolidate a couple of them because they're... Um, basically touching on the same themes uh, of responsible um, consumption of rum. Um, so I'm just gonna read this one. Someone said uh, around 2014, when I started to look into the dirty history of rum, I tried to find fair trade rums, nearly impossible. I was told by a rum bartender that it was because it was so hard to trace the ingredients. 
a while later, there was a brand that I forgot that everyone boycotted for a bit because they had been caught using unfair labor practices. So how can we support an industry that supports its workers and communities that um, it draws resources from? How can we hold brands accountable? How can we request transparency for brands in a way that will want our dollars? Yeah, that is a great question. So what I will say first and foremost is that um, in the eight years that I've owned Trailer Happiness, I've been fortunate enough to visit several several different distilleries, um, mostly rum, but not exclusively. And I can tell you that the treatment of workers, the treatment of the environment, um, sustainability, all of these factors are very, very much at the forefront of the minds of the distillery owners and the rum producers. So I know the um, the incident to which the person's referring to, I won't, I won't mention any names, but what I can say is that they have invested incredibly, like they have really, um, they, they had a little choice, but they have made a very large um, moves to rectify the issues that, that they, that they had created um, in their distillery. So in terms of holding these rum brands accountable, I will say that at the moment, I promise you within the rum community, they are rabid warriors. These guys will not let go. Like there is no distillery anywhere on earth that can get away with these types of practices in today, like anymore. It's just not gonna happen because either you're, either you're a distillery that will invite the rum heads to your distillery, in which case they're going to find out what's going on, or you're one of those distilleries that nobody's ever seen, in which case you're going to get called out. So in terms of accountability, I think that the rum community, the rum enthusiast community, holds rum to an incredibly high standard, probably higher than any other spirit I can think of. I think possibly tequila maybe also is, is held to a high standard, but definitely rum Rum lovers um, want to know every single aspect of their of their rum. So if you want to know about rums and, and trading fair trade practices and everything else, um, I'd advise you to join one of the many rum groups um, that are available on Facebook potentially, um, and bear with it for a moment. But you will get you will get the answers. You know you will get the answers that you need about any distillery that you're interested in supporting. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, um, one last question and <laughs> then we'll let you enjoy the rest of your night. But um, we are also wondering what is your favorite rum? What do you have on stock in your bar and why? What's my favorite rum? That's an impossible question. Um, I don't have a favorite rum. I definitely don't have a favorite rum. I will say that I have many favorites. I will say that a lot of my favorite rums at the moment are coming from Barbados. So you can grab yourself a rum from Barbados and feel pretty secure that you're getting a delicious liquid. But similarly, Fiji are doing some great stuff. Belize, I'm excited for stuff that's coming out there. Holmes Key producing um, some incredible um, independent bottlings. There's, there's, a, there's so much good rum out there at the moment. I'll be honest with you. Um, again, I've, I've been, you know, I've, I've been a, a rum guy for, I've considered myself a rum guy for a long time, but I've been a serious rum guy for, you know, really since I bought Trailer. And the the amount of good quality rum that exists now is, in, like, it's, it's amazing. It's a great time to get into rum. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much, Sly. This has truly been a pleasure. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, wow, okay. So for those of you that joined the conversation today, please do consider a donation directly to the Drinks Trust. Um, once again, that information can be found in the chat um, and it's for to help uh, folks in that industry and the hospitality industry um, with whatever they need, especially uh, in these super crazy challenging times. 
Um, we hope that you will join us next month for the second Sunday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time as we explore uh, BIPOC pinups, burly cues, and fashion hounds of the Tiki scene. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you next time. Later. Bye. Thank you.